Hey guys, Caitlin here, and for this week's YouTube video, I want to talk about evidence-based guidelines that you can use in your charting that are, I find, very helpful um, in your decision-making, your diagnostic workup, and your treatment for many different chief complaints. So, let's get started. The first two I want to talk about are the Wells and Perk criteria. So these are quite common. People use them often in the decision making to um, either rule in or rule out a pulmonary embolism as one of your differential diagnosis and the diagnostic workup you want to do thereafter. So I usually start with the Wells criteria and it's just a list of risk factors and or symptoms that the patient may be having and if they have a score of greater than four, I usually just think, oh, this is a high probability, it's a pulmonary embolism, and I go straight to the CT of their chest looking for that pulmonary embolism. Um, if it's less than four, but they do have some other um, PERC criteria that are concerning, I just grab a D-dimer on them. And if the D-dimer is positive, and make sure you do an age-adjusted D-dimer, then I go to the CTPE. Um, in some cases, when I know the D-dimer might be positive in some patients when they've had a lot of inflammation in their body lately or they just got out of surgery and I know it's going to be positive, then I'm just going to get the CTPE. Um, so that is Wells and Perk criteria. So the next two I want to talk about are the San Francisco and Canadian syncope rules. And you can find these um, on MD Calc, which is something I use often. So you can have that app on your phone or you can just Google it. Um, usually MD Calc is one of the first links that pops up when you type these in. So when a patient comes in with syncope, you've done your required workup, um, either looking at neurogenic, cardiogenic, um, or if you have a high suspicion for vasovagal, you can go through the San Francisco and Canadian syncope rules and it takes you through a list of risk factors that if the patient were to be discharged, the percentage they might have an, um, an adverse event after they were discharged from having syncope. So I like to use these rules to um, advocate for my decision to either admit for further workup or discharge the patient and I always add these rules in my chart and talk about them in my decision making. The next two I want to talk about are the CURB 65 and the PORT score and I use these in my decision making for um, disposition with patients with pneumonia. So um, you'll diagnose pneumonia all the time in the emergency department um, and sometimes it might be a 26 year old with um, mycoplasma pneumonia, satting fine on room air, um, tolerating PO with no other past medical history or immunocompromising factors. So what does that sound like to you? They can be treated on outpatient therapy. Um, but there are some patients uh, that have cancer and they're on chemotherapy and they have multilobular pneumonia um, and they're requiring oxygen. So that obviously needs admitting. But there's some patients that come into this gray area. You're just like, I don't know if they should be admitted or they should be dispoed. I don't want them to fill their discharge outpatient PO medicines and um, have an adverse event from that. So that's when I use the CURB 65 and PORT score. So CURB 65 is a little older rule. Um, it has five criteria. Um, and certain criteria um, add up to a certain number and then from that you can say oh outpatient therapy can be okay inpatient therapy or ICU if you meet um, a certain number for curve score and then the port score is that plus a little bit more so it's actually a little more sensitive and specific and it's a little newer um, then the CURB 65 score, and I like to use these in my charting, again, um, to advocate for the disposition I want for my patient. Um, and I also use it when convincing my patient wherever they need to go. So that is the CURB 65 import score for pneumonia disposition. So the next two I want to talk about are the Nexus and Canadian C-spine criteria. Um, so this helps with maybe a trauma patient coming in with the C-collar. So they're entering your emergency department with a C-collar and they give you good recommendations on when you think you might need imaging on the neck looking for a possible fracture or you can take off the C-collar with confidence. Um, they're interesting criteria that also give you on MD Calc give you a good idea of what type of imaging you should probably do. Because um, now a CT of the neck is 
definitely advocated for, especially in the elderly, is it's definitely more sensitive and specific for finding that fracture in such a very vulnerable area of the body. So that is the nexus in Canadian C-spine rules. The next two I want to talk about are the Canadian and pre-currency T rules. So when a patient comes in after a head trauma and because there's minor head traumas and then there's major head traumas and there's people that are not on blood thinners, there's people that are on blood thinners. These rules give you a good idea of the patients that you need to get a head CT on looking for a brain bleed. So um, if a patient comes in and they got hit in the football field, they're a young patient, they're on a blood thinner, um, they're negative for the Canadian CT rules and they have a completely normal neuro exam, it's not unreasonable to, to not scan these patients CT wise. Um, I just send them home with very, very strict return precautions of neuro worsening symptoms. Um, but if they do meet any of those rules, um, some of them like retrograde amnesia, loss of consciousness, um, a Gosswell coma scale of less than 15, then I definitely get the head CT and look for that brain bleed. Um, and another big one is if anyone's on a, bl a blood thinner with any sign of head trauma, I always get the head CT. Another one I like to use very often is the center criteria for strep throat. So um, I go through the center criteria with a lot of my patients with exudate on their tonsils and or a sore throat. And this really just guides me in my diagnostic workup. So um, if they are very low in the center criteria, I don't even test them. Um, if they are kind of the middle, I test them. And then if they meet four or more, then I don't even test them. I treat them with the appropriate treatment of antibiotics and send them home. Um, and then always look for the dangerous signs of strep throat, like paratonsillar abscess, uveal deviation, strider, and, and whatnot. Um, a couple of other ones I use are the red flags for headache and the red flags for lower back pain, both of which can also be found on MD Calc. Um, you guys can see I really like MD Calc. I like to use those two to guide, and again, my diagnostic workup. So um, there's a lot of red flags for headaches, and there's a lot of red flags for lower back pain. So, and sometimes I I forget one or forget a couple, so I always go through those with my patients. Um, even I'll go back into the room and ask a particular red flag question that I might have missed for their headache um, and make sure that's negative. And if any of them are positive, then um, that is a means for imaging. So a red flag for a low back pain um, or a red flag for a headache, you can either image those appropriately if they test positive in either one of those. And that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope these guidelines uh, help you with either dispoing your patient, whether you need to admit them or discharge them, um, or help you with your diagnostic workup and or treatment. I use these guidelines in all of those cases, and then I also... Um, chart these guidelines to make sure people knew what I was thinking when I was with this patient and why I did the things I did. So that's it for this week. I'll see you guys next week.